Hartman. All righty. Thank you for hanging out with me. Appreciate that. Sorry, I'm a little late to get started. I was missing an adapter. Just left, I think I left it here last talk. And I just need to find it. All my adapters have my name and phone number on them. So if you want my phone number, steal one of my adapters. <laughs> All right. I have been blogging since April of 2002. So that's 20 years. I've been taking a break for the last couple of months because I'm tired. But I've been blogging every Tuesday and Thursday for the last 20 years. I also have a podcast called Hansel Minutes that is named Hansel Minutes because I'm a very bad estimator. People would ask me how long something would take and I'd say about 30 minutes. And they would say, are those Hansel Minutes or are real minutes? <laughs> the podcast has been going on for 837 episodes. That's every Thursday for the last 16 years. Yeah, a long time. That's what old looks like. And um, it's worth pointing out that for the most part, this is a room full of old white guys, some young white guys. Do you know what a collective noun is? Like a gaggle of geese or a pride of lions? This is a, called a collective noun when you have more of something. It's a pride of lions. I don't know if they have that in different languages. It's a very English thing, just French or German or what, what language do you speak? Dutch. Dutch, they got that in Dutch? Just random words that they pick up like a, a, a wire of computer programmers, just make up a word like that? Yeah. yeah? Well, if you have more than two white guys, it's a podcast of white guys. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's not a good thing. So uh, you can take a look at the show here and notice that I, I found that there's a lot of cool people in tech doing a lot of really cool work. And I'm not having any trouble finding cool people from all over the world of all genders and flavors. And uh, one of the great things about having a show that goes back 800 episodes is I'm just flicking, still scrolling. I could probably give the whole talk and I'm still only in the 600s. So if you are interested in hearing from people who don't look like you, uh, and maybe inviting them to speak at your conference. Here are 837 people who have been pre-vetted to give great talks because they have given a great talk to me. And they go on and on. I'm still only in the 400s and I'm still going, not running out of people. Isn't that great? So I have Hanselman.com. I have the Hanselman blog and I have the podcast. This is Hanselman International. And I make dozens of dollars on, on Hanselman International. I think I made $8 on TikTok last month, $8.37. I made $150 on YouTube. It's not Nick Chappas money, but it's pretty good. Uh, and, uh, and then the blog it has some advertising and stuff like that, right? So I have a staff of me, and uh, it's, uh, it's an international wide-ranging company. I have offices in every country, it's Starbucks. Uh, and uh, before Microsoft, I was what's called an MVP, Microsoft, uh, I don't know, virtual professional, whatever. Most valuable professional. It's basically they just go, you're cool, here's free stuff. And one of the free things that they give you is hosting. Now, now they give you some Azure money. I think you get 100 bucks of Azure money or an MSDN, okay? But back in the day, in the late 90s, they would have third parties give you stuff. So you'd get like Telerik controls or Infragistics controls. And there was a company called OrxWeb that gave me a virtual machine. Hey, free virtual machine, that's cool. I'll put my blog there. So they say, hey, you're an MVP. Here's a free virtual machine, it's a $50 value. Cool. So free stuff, I love free stuff. So I get a Windows Server 2003 VM I remote desktop directly into production the way God intended us. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Hanselmaning into production, right? And I just FTP my files into IIS and I put Hanselman.com up and I, hey, I'm blogging, it's free, Wee, right? 
20 years ago. And it works great. And I'm using this great blogging engine. It's called Das Blog, which is German for the blog. It's true. You have to say it like Das Blog. Yeah. For my Germans. I can say that. I can make fun of Germans because Hanselmann is a German name with the two N's. We lost one end going across the, the ocean. Where's the other N? But every time I go back to Germany, they see this German face and the German glasses. They go, oh, Herr Hanselmann, welcome. <laughs> Sorry, man. I don't speak German. Um, there's actually a Hanselmann bakery in Holland with two N's. I need to go and get some free food because that must be a cousin. <laughs> so all of this is on a Windows Server 2003. And if you've ever used IIS, Internet Information Server, it's you, you go into the IIS, um, um, what's it called, MMC. What does MMC stand for? Something, something console? Microsoft? Management console. There it is. Thank you. Pre appreciate that, Dylan. So they go into the management console, and you have this tree. So basically, one server equals one uh, port, port 80, and then you have applications. And an application runs in its own memory space. Uh, you could run everything in its own memory space, but I basically had three apps. I had the podcast, I had the home page of the website, which was a separate app from slash blog. And this is going to be important later because URLs matter. So right here, we have Hanselman.com, and then if we hit slash blog, that's a separate app. Okay, and this was on DAS blog, D-A-S blog. Uh, running on .NET 2 uh, and then running later on .NET 3. And I was just kind of living my life, doing my thing, and everything was great. And then I started getting the yellow screen of death. Are you familiar with the yellow screen of death? You hit a .NET website and you've, you're, not very, you're not very good at your job uh, and you've poorly configured it. And it usually says, you should not be seeing this in production. And then it gives you the source code of the website. So that was bad. Uh, and I hadn't set up any kind of DevOps or uh, you know, PagerDuty or Pingdom. These are those web, web applications that will text you when your website goes down. Instead, people tweet me. So Twitter is like, yeah, answer when your blog is down. Oh, thank you. That's embarrassing. Um, and I got a particular yellow screen of death that said, you're out of disk space. I didn't know that. I have a virtual machine, right? I have unlimited disk space. So I call the company called OrcsWeb, and I said, can you give me more space uh, on the virtual disk? And they said, who are you? And I, I said, well, I'm Scott Hanselman. You gave me a web, you gave me a, a thing later. And I said, well, OrcsWeb has been sold. We're not OrcsWeb anymore. The company doesn't exist. I said, but my website's still up. <laughs> so how is that a thing? Well, we sold it to these Quebecois in, in, in the French-speaking part of Canada. And it's called SureWeb. That's a very different name. Uh, so OrcsWeb has become SureWeb, and now they have a French accent. And so I call them. I go, ha ha. <laughs> it's me. Uh, I have a website. And uh, they said, qu'est-ce que c'est? Who are you? I said, I'm Scott Hanselman. I have a website. And they said, well, we have no record of you existing. I said, my website's still up, though. I can ping it. I know it's a thing. Like, I can ping Hanselman.com, and it goes to a website. And he says, I'll call you back. Uh, and he calls me back, and it turns out I never had a virtual machine. It was a physical computer. <laughs> uh, and it was under Jeff's desk. But now Jeff is gone. So now it's a physical computer under Alain's desk. <laughs> they had this idea that they were going to give all the MVPs virtual machines, but they didn't have enough. So they just took a mini tower and they put, my <laughs> they put a computer on it and they put it under this guy's desk. And then they sold it. And they, you know, I had a note like, don't turn this off or something. And they, they ended up taking it to the, uh, the hosting service and then putting it on a shelf and plugging it in, and they forgot about it. And I said, well, that's problematic, uh, as the kids say. 
and uh, could you maybe expand the hard drive? And they said, well, I don't think you understand. <laughs> this, is, this is a spinning rust hard drive. Like, you can hear it, right? And if you're old enough to remember when you could hear your, your hard drive, that's not a good thing if you can hear your hard drive, right? And this is really important because a lot of young people don't understand like what the cloud is for or how it works or why it exists, right? The cloud is just a fancy way of saying other people's computers. That's all it is. Why do we, well, you look young. I'm going to say you're a crisp 29. Uh, you're probably 22, but that's fine. These shoes are 22. Um, have you ever seen the cloud? Have you ever been there? You ever been to a hoster? Okay. Well, it's, like, well, it's like a refrigerator, right? It's just like rows and rows and rows. Have you seen the end of Indiana Jones? Yeah? That's the cloud. When they push everything in, that's where my computer is. It's in one of those boxes at the end of Indiana Jones. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 I needed them to find it. And one of the great things about the cloud and the difference between the cloud and hosting is that with, the cl with, the, with hosting, you can visit your computer. It's like if you send one of your relatives or grandma or grandpa to the home, you can go and check on them. But the cloud is like they're in the home and you don't know where they are. There's a piece of grandma here and a piece over there and they're spread out across them. It's a really a messy analogy. The point is you could go up to the computer and you could have your laptop and then push refresh and you could hear the hard drive go click, click, click. And you go refresh, click, click, click. And there's a direct relationship between the page loaded and the computer did some stuff. Okay? But with the cloud, the hard drive is here and the memory is over there and the processor is over there and it's all connected with software-based networking. So I have a situation where I'm in the U.S. in Portland, Oregon, and my computer is under someone's desk in Quebec, and I don't speak French, and I have a 30-gig hard drive. I don't know about you, but I've accidentally swallowed 30 gigs. You know, you put an SD card in your mouth and you turn around and, oh, my God. 64 gigs is gone like that, right? So 30 gigs is not a lot of space. So I'm remote desktoping into this thing, into production, deleting log files on the regular. I've even written a script, and I, I'm literally like 100 megabytes. You know, and then you hit refresh in Explorer, and you see it's like 60 megabytes, 30 megabytes, is like, and then yellow screen of death. So it's getting really bad. Now, I had eventually had a plan that I was going to go and upgrade this thing. But now I don't have a plan. I have a deadline, which is different. Okay? So let's talk, about, let's talk about why this is a problem and how this became incredibly scary and stressful. Because keeping in mind that I have dozens of dollars to deal with here, uh, where budget is minimal. Don't ever trust an Azure salesperson who gets their, their Azure time for free. Only, pay, only trust them if they pay with their own money. So I pay with my own money. OK, so I've got these three websites, Hanselman.com, is brochureware, brochureware. It's like a super basic website. And then this is a blog. It's kind of sophisticated. It was on .NET 2.0. That's Windows only. That's a problem. This is on Razor Pages slash MVC. It's a little bit newer. I think it was .NET 4. And this is all running on Windows Server 2003. Some of you were not born then. There's a lot wrong here. There's a lot wrong here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Windows Server 2003 was great in 2003 and even 2004. Uh, but there's things that you want it to do that it can't do, like TLS, which is secure sockets. Uh, it turns out that Windows Server 2003 like, supported like TLS 1.2, but doesn't do 1.3. So now I'm patching DLLs on an actual physical server with, that you can hear that's clicking. There's another thing that's a problem. This is a 19-year-old computer. Do you know what MTBF is? Who wants to tell me what that is? Mean time before failure. Mean being average time before failure. So. Uh, does anyone have a really old cat? <laughs> Cats are not supposed to be 23. God bless them. They're just not. Uh, neither are hard drives, and certainly not ones that spin. The mean time before failure of a hard drive at the time that I purchased this hard drive was about five years. Now it's about seven, which is a lie, because it's really five. 
So I have a, I have a 19 year old a hard drive here. Uh, not only can this be a problem if your cat is that old, but if you ever had a car that you're afraid to stop, because it may not start again, I know in my soul if this hard drive stops spinning, it is never going to start again. So I got to get this stuff off it. Toot sweet, as the Quebecois say. Uh, so that's a problem. Doesn't do TLS. It's spinning. I'm on borrowed time. This is a huge problem. So I, first, I back it all up. Back it all up. Back it all up. So that's handled. At least I've got copies of everything. But I don't know when I built the thing. I'm, one, I'm a one-person one shop, right? Remember when Microsoft was telling you to right-click and publish in Visual Studio? It, at least we right-click and publish to GitHub, which then builds in GitHub and then does DevOps, right? At least it, it's DevOpsy. But um, right-click, I was just right into production. Right? If your deployment strategy is opening two Explorer windows and copying DLLs from one folder to another, that's probably not a deployment strategy. That was my deployment strategy for a number of years. That's like when your source code strategy is a zip file. It says v1.zip, v2.zip. These were, these were different times, friends. So I don't trust the code. I can't build it reliably. It only runs on Windows. It only runs on this one machine. So what would be the naive way to move this to the cloud? It would be totally valid, and businesses do it every day. There's even a fancy word for it. Lift and shift. Lift and shift is a lie. It's a bad, bad idea, right? It's what we tell people. You're going to do digital transformation. Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? You're going to lift and shift into the cloud. I'm going to take an image of the disk that is about to die that's too small, and I'm going to put an image of it in the cloud, and then I'll make it a little bit bigger, right? It's just I'm going to upload your brain into the matrix, and you're still on Windows Server 2003. You just don't really exist in the physical world anymore. That is not a good idea, because I'm really putting a Band-Aid or a bandage on cancer, right? This thing is going to die. And I'm just keeping it alive in, you know, the Neo matrix kind of a world. So that was, that was a thing. I could do that, though. I would do what's called disk to VHD. It's a tool you can get from Sys Internals. It takes an image of the disk, puts it into an image file, and then you run the image file on the cloud. That would be a, a patch. That was my, uh, my oh shit button. You know, oh shit, puts a button. That would be what I would do. But I feel like I can do better than that. Uh, so I have a problem with trust, I have a problem with security, I have a problem with source. So we got source, we got trust, we got security. When I say trust, I mean I don't trust that I can build the thing again. So the first thing I wanted to do was figure out if I could run this thing on platform as a service, because I don't want to do IaaS. IaaS is infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is fine, but it's like free like a puppy, you know, like here's a puppy. Oh, a puppy. I love puppies. You got to feed it. You got to water it. You got to keep it alive. I don't have dogs. I don't know what you have to do with dogs, but there's watering in there somewhere, right? This is all the stuff like, oh, I'm so happy I have a free puppy. If you give, someone gives you a free Windows machine in the cloud, you have to remote in. You got to run Windows Update. You got to manage it. You got to talk to it with PowerShell. Even if they give you a free Linux machine in the cloud, you got to go and apt get upgrade and apt get update. You got to, you got to maintain it or you got to pay somebody to maintain it. Because you're deciding that your agreement, your relationship with the computer, is going to be at the kernel level. Think about that for a second. I'm writing an app that does blogging. And I'm going to, to agree that, that what the kernel provides is the, is the level that I'm interested in. I want memory, I want hard drive, and I want kernel calls. And that means that. In 20 years, it's going to be an old version of something that I never really thought about. Platform as a service says, I don't care about the operating system that much. I don't care about the kernel. I care about the platform that I wrote it on, Node, .NET, Python, PHP, whatever. The version of that is what matters. If you go into Azure and you make a new app service, you, you just say, I want Node or I want .NET. You don't even need to think about the, op the underlying operating system. I don't know what version of Windows those things run on top of or what version of Linux. I don't care. So the analogy would be I can buy a car and I think about the engine and I care about the brand of the car. 
or I just rent a car. I don't care. Four doors. Right? You don't go and rent a car and say, I want a Honda. No, you say four doors or two doors. These are the basic things that you care. I don't really care. And then you, you don't treat the car very well when you rent a car, do you? Right? Like my hotel room, right? I've completely thrashed my hotel room here at the conference because I'm a rock star, right? And I expect that when I return to the hotel room, it'll be put back together because right? it's platform as a service, right? So my job is to just flip the beds over and just eat all the snacks and then come back and it's been put back together, right? I'm not really doing that. I make the bed. But the, the point is, that's the kind of relationship. Now, if I owned the house, I would treat it better. So you treat physical machines differently. You treat virtual machines differently. You, you deal with them. You weed the garden and you clean them up. So platform as a service would be a really nice place to start. But Windows costs a little bit more, so I want to move everything over to Linux. So a couple things that I needed to do was figure out what's the easiest thing and what's the hardest thing. So I sorted these, and I figured that a brochureware site would be the easiest, the podcast would be the second easiest, and the blog would be the hardest. So the brochureware site was using Razor Pages, which is, uh, was MVC3, .NET 4. It was not a big deal to move it over into, um, uh, move it over into, uh, into .NET Core. I'm just looking at my, my explorer down there. I don't know why my icons are hard to see. I think I'm at a weird resolution. Sorry about that. Give me one second. Check my resolution, and then blow away Windows Explorer because it's confused and still confused. You're going to just be down there in the corner, aren't you? All right, we won't be launching files that way. We'll go into terminal. We'll go over here. So this is my, I'm using Windows Terminal, if you didn't see before. This is called Oh My Posh which gives me that nice prompt. You can see the folder. You can see my blood sugar in real time right there. Uh, 100 is good. Uh, if it's lower than that, let me know. Uh, I've got my branch. That is real, by the way. I'm not joking. I'm type 1 diabetic. I have implants and insulin pumps, and they talk to the cloud, which also needs to run platform as a service or I'll die. Um, and then <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> and then each time I hit enter, it makes a web service call to get my blood sugar. And then that's really important because th notice that it's on the left. It's more important than my Git branch, which is secondarily as important as my blood sugar. And then my uh, the current version of .NET. So this particular app, I can go and run code dot, and we'll bring up Visual Studio Code real quick, and we trust everything. And this was a nice, simple application. It was not complicated. All the defaults are here, nothing fancy. The only thing I added was a robots.txt file for SEO purposes to tell my system through Google that I wanted certain things um, spidered. And I've got like the books I've written and my about page and an index, my list of podcasts. These are pretty straightforward pages. Moving this over to .NET was not hard, .NET Core. So if we go to Hanselman.com, we can see that that loads very fast, and it's got the About page and the list of podcasts. It's got my newsletter, and it works pretty well. What I added at the bottom was a little real-time powered by thing here. That's not actually um, static text. I'm actually looking at that and pulling it out of the DLL. And when I got that running on .NET, and I can run it locally. I then wanted to switch over to Ubuntu in another tab here. I'm going to go ahead and click Ubuntu, and I'm going to open a split pane. And now I've got Linux on the right and Windows on the left over here. And then we're going to go into Hanselman Core, which is in a different file system. And I'm going to say .NET Build. So now I can run it in both Linux and Windows. The reason that I did that is I wanted choice because I was seeing places that would let me host Linux for 30% less than Windows. So being able to have these things run in two places was important. It was also a practice run to see if I could get the blog and the podcast running on Linux as well. So I'm going from .NET 2 to 4, then from 4 to 6, and trying to figure out what would work and what wouldn't. Because it's cross-platform, I want to make sure that I'm not using any Windows-specific APIs. There's no registry 
on Linux, so I can't call the registry. The only bugs that I found were pathing bugs, where I was assuming a backslash instead of a forward slash. But there's system.io.path.directory separator and things like that. So just constants for backslashes versus forward slashes. So there were places I was writing to the file system. Other than that, it literally just works. It's super actually creepy how well it works. And it's valuable even if you deploy to Windows today to just have it running in both places so that you know that you can if you ever want to move. What was cool about that then is I could then, because it's running on Linux, very quickly and easily get it running on Docker. So I did that next experiment with my uh, podcast site, which is, do, 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 do. I like my cool stuff like that, isn't that neat? I have a whole article on my blog about your ultimate command line setup. I can do coloring, I can do autocomplete as a history dropdown, makes life a lot easier. I don't use CD, I use a thing called Z, which is faster and cooler. So I'm gonna bring up code. So this is my podcast. And then I made a Docker file. One of the great things about having your own website is you're running something in production and you're learning about production on a thing that doesn't really matter. This is really, really powerful. I recommend this to anyone, no matter where they are in their career, whether they're earlier or in later. This is the equivalent of having an old car that you don't need to commute in your garage that you can always be tinkering with. Right? My podcast site doesn't really matter. Like I said, I'm not making any money on it. So if it's down for a couple of hours, fine. But I feel like there's a lot of people who are in a business where they know about their slice of an app or their slice of a website, but they're not full stack developers. But it's hard to be a full stack developer and know the complete Amazon.com. No one could know it, it's too big. But I know every single thing on this website and all three of these websites. And what's cool about that is Docker comes out. Huh, I wonder if I can use Docker on my website. Hey, Redis is a thing. Maybe I'll cache some stuff in Redis. Azure Platform as a Service, I'll put some stuff in Platform as a Service. It doesn't work, I'll roll it back. GitHub Actions, Azure DevOps. Like When a new thing comes out, I try it out. And if it works, I keep it. And what's cool about this is that, and of course, I've been running uh, sites for longer than this, but no one carries the pager but me. When the site goes down, I hear about it, and I'm responsible for its uptime. When SSL certificates expire, it's on me to come up with a plan for that. And then I can decide, is right-click publish in Visual Studio a good idea, or do I need DevOps? Do I, how do I do source control? Do I, pull, do I do pull requests to myself? Running your own website, even if it's just a static web app, is how you learn a ton about systems. I see a lot of people who are early in career putting together uh, very simplistic portfolios, and I just really love to see a complete, simple website, just a blog that you run yourself. Because what I want to hear is that you have stories about it going down, and you brought it back to life. So I can tell you stories about breaking things, about getting attacked by spammers, and all the kind of, there's all kinds of cool stuff that you only learn when you do these things in production. So here, I've got .NET 6. I learned all about Docker. I'm gonna show you this really quick. This is cool. This is called a multi-stage build file. Notice on line one it says as build. So you're creating a container. You're compiling the code in that container. It's named build. And then when you're done, you run .NET build. So now the result of the, uh, the output of that container lives in that, that container called build. Then based on build, you create a new one called publish, and you make a working directory and you publish the .NET application into an output folder. So now I have a container with all of my applications in it, and what's interesting about it is it's got the SDK, the compiler, a bunch of stuff I don't wanna ship. I don't need that surface area, the security surface area of that. So then take a look at line 33. We then switch to a different container that's just the runtime for .NET. And then we copy on line 35 that out folder. So the building happens with the compiler and it's a big heavy container, it's like 300 megs, it's got all of .NET and everything I need to build. 
then the result moves over to a tiny runtime container that's like 100 megs. And then I go and do that. I had been publishing, I didn't know about this, I'd been publishing the whole thing, all of .NET, the .NET SDK and the compiler and everything. So I learned about multi-stage build files and then you see the entry point there on line 36 where I can run my application in a, in a um, container. So already I'm making progress moving stuff over and then I went and wrote a little Docker build, PS file, a little PS1, a little PowerShell script. And uh, am I running Docker? That might not actually work. I think I need to run Docker first. I don't think I'm running Docker right now. So let me fire up Docker. I don't know what's going on with my, uh, my toolbar there. Something, so you see how I'm seeing um, the lower part of the screen there being cut off? So I'm just gonna pretend that I know what's happening down here. That looks like the top of someone's head there. I don't know what's going on. Let's try again, see if my Docker is gonna build. Working in the dark here. It's good though, because if things always work, then it doesn't, there you go, it's no fun. There you go. So now we're building that entire application in Docker. I was surprised how 17, 18 year old code in .NET easily moved over into uh, .NET Core 6. It was pretty cool. Uh, just as an example, if you take a look at my tweets in the last couple of days, uh, I wrote an application a while ago called Baby Smash, babysmash.com. It is a game for little kids, for babies. They can smash the keyboard and it puts letters and numbers and sings and dances and talks to them and stuff like that. My baby is 16 and driving. <laughs> Somebody ported it over to Avalonia, which is an open source framework based on WPF, and now it runs on a Mac. So the baby is 16, Baby Smash lives on, and I actually have a donate button on the Baby Smash website. I get about $8 a month on Baby Smash. So, you know, for, for 16 years, that's, uh, that's big money. <laughs> True story. Uh, it's been like, like 60 bucks, right? Um, so that was an example where an application was created in you know, 16 years ago and has now moved over to the cloud as well. So here, now this is actually running, that application's running and running tests. So I'm actually running X unit text tests inside of, of Docker itself. Now I, I was using Selenium. Selenium is a unit testing application that lets you actually click on buttons, but I'm finding it to be a little bit unreliable. So I'm gonna translate it over to a thing called Playwright and Playwright runs in a container headless and it works really well. So I'm gonna learn about Playwright on a real website as opposed to just doing a tutorial. So again, a little bit of an advertisement there to go and learn how to do these things yourself. So there you go. So now I've gone and I've tagged podcast latest. So I can say Docker images. And there we go, created 23 seconds ago. I've got my podcast site running in, in Docker. So then I can go over to the website. Let's go to my personal profile. I'm gonna to go to Azure. Go to the Azure portal here real quick. Nope, nope. Log it in, log it in. They should make like wait or hold music or something when you do this stuff. Dude, no, it's still me, go away. Take a look at my application running up in Azure. And we have app service plan. I'm using my MSDN. Here we go, an app service plan is actually a virtual machine of sorts. You see, I've got four applications running on a single app service. A lot of people think that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between an app service plan and an app, and that costs them money. That costs them a lot of money because a physical computer, if it gets to be around 50% CPU, you'll think, I'm, this machine's working too hard. I need another one because I need room to breathe. But in the cloud, you don't. You can run these machines hot, 60, 70, 80% CPU, nothing wrong with it. If it gets higher than that, then you get another one. So I've got the blog, the brochureware site, the podcast, and Azure Friday, which is another podcast that I do, all running in the same single $35 app service plan. And what's cool about that is I can go back to the plan and I can look at the memory 
app service plans. See, I've got six on this Windows Basic and I've got four in this Linux Premium. I'm gonna click on that and let's look at our memory situation. Check out the CPU percentage, about 12%. It's kind of just doing its thing. Memory percentage, 65%. That would be too much on a physical computer. But I wanted this to be as cheap as possible because I'm going from a free server from the Canadians to this one here that I want to pay as little as possible for. And one of the things that people don't realize about the cloud is that the cloud's a little slower than a physical machine. It just is. Like you're always going to feel like it's not quite as fast as your actual machine because there's a lot going on on the cloud and you're sitting next to other people on the same virtual machine. But the thing that the cloud gives you a lot of is RAM. So when you hear about cloud native, what does that mean to have a cloud native application? That's an application that knew about the cloud at the time that you architected it. The cloud has a lot of memory. Memory is cheap. So I have a blog and the blog has no database. DOS blog, it's well known for its most famous feature, which is no database, because databases cost money, and it's just a blog. So let me show you what the internals of the blog are. Let me see if I, ooh, you know what I actually don't have? I just realized that this computer I rebuilt from scratch, so let's try this doesn't have what I need on it. So you know what we're gonna do, friends, live on this machine that barely works right now, is let's try remote desktoping into my house. You said right? If I remember the password, it's right. I use an app called Tailscale. It's a mesh VPN network, it's free. It's amazing. So if this works, it's amazing. If it's not works, then it's not tail scale. And I forgot the internet here sucks. Oh, there you go. Okay, there's my desktop. I know where everything is, so shut up. <laughs> Savages. <laughs> Why are you so mean? Um, where <laughs> I know where everything is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everything is. Blog backup, here we go. See if you can do better with your, with your empty, empty desktop. Okay, there's DOS blog. That is 4,964 XML files in a folder. You laugh now, but I've been blogging for 20 years. It works just fine. You know, I mentioned a little bit uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the opening keynote about how the world is just name value pairs in the cloud. It's just a big distributed hash table, right? XML, JSON, any files, INI files, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't freaking matter. You can laugh at that. The file system is a goddamn good database. I can do random access. But you know what I can do with a lot of RAM? I can load every blog post for 20 years into memory and hold it there. How much memory do you think that is? 20 years of blog post every Tuesday and Thursday, two decades. 365 times 20 times two plus content. Guess? 12 gigs, gentlemen said. Try again. 100 megabytes, that's a little, a little kind of just swung entirely in a different direction. 384 megs. My life's work fits in less than a half a gig. No pictures. That's a great, I love that you brought that up. He says, no pictures though. Good point. Where do the pictures go? We're cloud native now. CDN. You say CDN? CDN, exactly. So I want this to not just move to the cloud. I want it to be better. So I got a lot of memory. So I increased my cache. I no longer seek to the hard drive. So when I press F5, I don't hear the hard drive because it's already in memory. It's only a couple hundred megs. So I have an in-memory database. These files are just loaded up on startup. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. You're not gonna need it. Well, you could have used MongoDB, Scott. Well, I could have done a static site generator. That would have been even cleaner, 
right? I'm using the in-memory stuff as a static site generator. It's just I statically generated the site in memory and not on disk. The concept is the same. And my, my, um, my seek time is sub, sub milliseconds, three, four, five milliseconds. It's nothing because RAM is cheap. So uh, graphics, I want the site to be better. How can I do that? Well, we can take good use and smarter use of DNS. Let's go to hanselminutes.com and we'll go on episodes and we'll right click on these people and we'll say open image in new tab. What's that? That is a C name. That's a subdomain. You make a CDN. It sits on top of Azure storage. You drop an image into the thing. You apply the CDN to it. Now you get two benefits. One, all the images are in a content distribution network, which means that they're closer to the user, which means my Indian blog readers and my Australian blog readers are getting the image loaded locally in their country. It also means that because it's at a separate DNS, we get parallel DNS lookups. You can have up to three or five on Chrome. I can't remember. It's a number that's bigger than one. It's like three or five. And what that means is if you've got images dot and JavaScript dot and CSS dot, the browser will see that there are three separate websites parallelize the work instead of them all going to www. So just by moving it to another location uh, and a DNS, I'm getting a huge speed up and the CDN is going to be cheaper. And if I go to Azure Storage Explorer, which is at storageexplorer.com, it's just kind of like a, a file explorer for Azure. And we open that up. I can go and upload the next week's show by just dragging and dropping it into the Storage Explorer. So here I've got under quick access, I'll make that bigger. I'm spoiled for my internet at home. Go to podcast. Take a look at this. We've got our shows. And then for each show, we've got the name of the, uh, we've got the uh, show number dot JPEG. I'm a big fan of this style. So for example, I could have had a database with a column and then the URL for the particular image, but I don't need that. I have a show number. So do you want to know who's on next week's show? You just go and hack the URL, right? So show next week is show 838, right? So it's Dan from Avalonia who's got a booth outside, so you can go say hi to Dan. Maybe that's a security problem. Maybe that's a feature. I don't know. I think it's pretty, <laughs> I think it's kind of awesome, right? <laughs> right? Like who's on after Dan? I don't even know now, right? I gotta, Go and see, hey, that's this guy, right? So I can just go and upload that stuff. Now, if I right click on it and say copy URL, that's the actual URL, Hanselman at cdn.blob.core.whatever. But by instituting a very simple system like this, there's no database. Check out how I do, this is also a bit of a discussion around architecture and the concept of Yagni. You know what Yagni is? You are not going to need it. Yagni is great. So if we go here to the, uh, the podcast and we go to sponsors, because I have a little advertisers on the show, I'm a big fan of this different style of development, my friends. I think that people make things way more complicated than they need to. And in doing that, it costs them money. I don't want to spend any money. So here's my list of sponsors right here, okay? I have an ID and I have the name, I have a URL and I have the image to the advertisement. That's cool, it's a database. How often do I change sponsors? Like three times a year. Well, you don't have an admin website and a whole thing, to, I have a text file. Works just great, cost me zero dollars. So here's the part where I'm not good at JSON. This is how I manage my Sponsors. I have a show number and I have the two sponsors for that week. Show only comes out on Thursdays. I have to edit that file on Thursdays. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I could make it. You could, but you could make an app. Yeah, I could. But I have a, I have a text file though. And I cache it for a week and it doesn't cost me anything. 
You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at this opportunity to move everything into the cloud. And I'm trying to save money and I'm making things way, way, way simpler. So when I actually do my, my editing, I record the show and I put everything into an input folder in Dropbox and I have an editor that I pay and then she puts the result into a folder called Output. It's just, it's so much simpler. And this would scale. This could be a real company and it still wouldn't matter. I, do, I would not need to spend that much. Now here's the problem though. I go into Azure and I don't feel like I'm a company though. You have to have a dashboard if you want to be a company. Because you know when you go to a company and you like go into their lobby and they have a TV that's been mounted, not just like on a desk, but they, they paid someone to mount the TV, that's when you know they've got the money. And they have a picture of the earth with pins of all the places that they've done business. I want that for myself, uh, but I'm only me. So it turns out Application Insights will make a dashboard for you, and then you can buy a TV. So I go into Application Insights, and they auto-generate this whole dashboard, and I get a TV from like for 300 bucks at Walmart, and I hang it up, and then I put it in my office, and when my parents come to visit, I say, this is my company. <laughs> Pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, check it out, right? Average server response time of five milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just got some eyebrows from the gentleman in the second row there. Mm -hmm. Five milliseconds, very nice. What are those spikes about though, Hanselman? I don't know, that's a 100 millisecond spike there. Probably a cache miss or a reset of the cache, something like that. What's cool about this is we hear this talk of 10X developers. Don't you hate that? I'm like a 0.5x developer and they're telling me I'm 20x behind. This is awful. 10x developers are meant to make you feel bad. Yes, there are genius developers who type faster than you. That's great. But what makes a 10x developer isn't that. It's the tools behind them. I'm one person. 20 years ago when I was working on three-letter domains, I worked on 800.com and gear.com. Websites, back when having a website that had three or four letters was a big deal because we didn't think people would type more than four or five letters. We had to hire someone to come and set up load balancing. And they would fly a consultant in and we'd buy a box and they'd rack it into the thing and then they'd set it all up and they'd say, don't touch it. We configured it to load balance. <laughs> Balance the load using round robin. Round robin, oh my God, that's a, that's a very complicated, how does it work? It's a secret sauce, we, you, you flew us here to do that. Now, when you're old, you don't have to have a one page resume. How, how long is your resume? It's one page, right? Two? Four pages? What, you have pictures or a dashboard? What, what do you got four pages? You're like an elder millennial. That's amazing. I want to see what your four-page resume looks like. That's amazing. I, I have a three-page resume. Uh, and the page two is the 90s. It's like a thematic. It's a thematic. I do it like the, the page two, the 90s. And it's just how to load balance. And now that's a checkbox in Azure. So now I just have a two-page resume. Uh, page one and page three. And I just ripped page two out because I was ashamed. Uh, because for me, like you would hire a consultant, they would rack the servers and then you'd work all weekend and then your boss would come in and you'd say, we scaled the website and then you put it on your resume and then you have page two. Uh, and now the, the young people at my company, they go, ah, this website is taking like a minute to like scale. Uh, and it's like a checkbox. The entire decade that I spent learning how to load balance across the internet is a checkbox now, you know what I mean? And then they'll be like, it's, it's a new feature, it's a slider bar now. You can slide it, slide it, and then they get paid for that. It's amazing. So I used to feel bad about that. I used to feel like maybe I need to learn more stuff. And then I realized, what a gift that they don't need to learn that. They're standing on the shoulders of all that great work. I love that the young people can push the checkbox and build a four-page resume out of it. That's amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really have no idea what, I, I couldn't fill a four page resume. It's all just check boxes. <laughs> Dashboards, what's that? 
Oh, we've got to have more pictures. That's true. Yeah, animated GIFs will fill up a resume, too, when you print them out. Um, having something like this makes me feel like a 10x developer because I'm one person, and now I can go to my website. Check this out. This is a feature that I love. I think everybody should do this. I'm going to go to hanselminutes.com. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. Check this out. This is the coolest thing I've done all year. The version of the runtime that I'm running, which tells me the platform updated itself. A link to the commit that's live in production right now. That's hot. And the build logs from the actual thing. Now, if you don't want to do that in public, you could just do it like when you're logged in as admin. But think about how cool that would be at work. Remember how I said I didn't trust my computer anymore? I don't know when I deployed last. I don't know what I put into production. I don't know what's going on. But now I'm a 10x developer because of the cloud. So I'm going to go and click on the commit. And I'm going to go directly to that. Ah, I can't get to it because of my right click, open link is work. Check it out. All right. Looks like my last commit was November 30th, and it was uh, some space. <laughs> I, I removed that space, and I sent it into production. That was how my father did it. <laughs> that <was> how <laughs> I thought it would be a more impressive <laughs> just some space. Is that significant white space? It was to me. And then I can go in here and actually see the release and see the job and the actual code and the test that ran. We couldn't even conceive about that when I was doing this stuff. We had a team to do this kind of stuff. So when they make you feel bad for not being a 10x developer, are you using the tools that will make you that way? Have you got your projects on GitHub Actions, on DevOps? Do you have them in the cloud in a way that you can be confident about them? Do you have a reasonable amount of tests? Have you hooked up Selenium or Playwright to do real testing in that space? Do you know that your stuff runs on Windows and on Linux? The last thing I want to show you, because I'm out of time, is the concept of the reverse proxy, whether it be Azure Front Door, which is what I use, or something like Cloudflare. It is significantly powerful because remember at the beginning, I talked about how the URL was important, that Hanselman slash blog was different than Hanselman itself. That is because I'm using a reverse proxy. And what that means is you all didn't notice my website being upgraded. You probably didn't know any of this was happening. That's because I was running the website in a parallel location. www.hanselman.com was going to the machine in Quebec. Staging.hanselman.com was a mirror of the site running in the cloud. And then I did A-B testing. And I put 50% of the traffic in one place and 50% of the traffic in the other until I felt confident that you all wouldn't notice. And then I did a VIP swap. I swapped the IPs. Nobody noticed. And then I slowly backed off of staging. And then I called the Canadians. And I said, au revoir. <laughs> and now everything's running in the cloud. Isn't that cool? We have the tools. We have the tools. This would have taken a team to do this kind of stuff before. Last thing on um, DOS blog. Uh, Mark Downey, who's a wonderful gentleman from Microsoft, who is actually a uh, Englishman in, uh, I think he's an Englishman in Cincinnati. And uh, he made DOS Blog Core, and he is running that now over at uh, Papa String, and he's doing active development on this. So this now 18-year-old blog engine is on .NET Core. So I can go to each of my sites. I can tell that it's running on .NET, which version it's running on. They're all running on Azure. App service. They're running in one Azure app service. And the other, one last thing I'll show you was I also, while I was at it, I took AzureFriday.com and upgraded it as well. And because I'm a big fan of, um, of caching, Azure Friday loads a JSON file of 700 episodes of Azure Friday, loads them into memory, and then allows you to just type what you're interested in and it instantaneously gives you what you want because it's all done in memory. People aren't caching enough. 
You don't probably need a database. And if you do need a database, cache the stuff anyway. Real time, you don't need it in real time. Everybody says, I need real time data. No, you don't. Every five, 10 minutes, eh, it's real time enough. You cache something for five, 10 minutes, it's going to make your application way faster. If I'm only blogging twice a week, then make it a cache for 16, 20 hours. If my podcast comes out every Friday, do it like that. If your product catalog doesn't change more than once a day, cache the whole thing. Memory is cheap. Facebook holds the entire social graph in memory. Billions of people in memory. It's way easier. Just hold it all in Redis. Big distributed hash table in the cloud. Isn't that great? So that's kind of how I moved all of this stuff to the cloud, systematically and slowly, one piece at a time, putting things in as many places that are static as possible, avoiding having to run a Windows server, getting it to work on both Linux and uh, Windows, using WSL locally to test on, adding in Docker, because I want flexibility about where I'm going to put this stuff, and then hiding it all behind a reverse proxy so no one knew I was doing it. End of speech. Cool. Any questions, any fundamental disagreements? And thank you for being such a good sport. That was really cool. Any thoughts, comments, questions? All right. Well, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, what if it was like a web forms application? It was. So that's a great question. DOS blog was a web forms application, but it was well factored where there was a runtime engine, which was list of blog, you know, list of blog posts, list of comments, stuff like that. So I had a, a layer because it was done in the classic three tier style, you know, view model controller, or in this case, business logic database and front end. So 70% of the code was written in .NET standard which moved cleanly to .NET Core 6. We literally have the exact same code from 17 years ago recompiled, and the only thing we changed was the paths. But when we got to web forms, we had these weird templates. We converted them to razor pages, consuming the same objects. So I had these web form pages with like a control that would be like a list of blog posts. I changed that to a for loop uh, for each post in posts. And then the template that used to be controls, I switched them to tag helpers in razor pages. So it was tedious, but it was possible. Now we have actually a direct mapping between web forms and Blazor. So Blazor server, you can go and have like, you, have, you used a grid, we have that same grid in Blazor. And we have a whole um, architecture guide at the .NET website at dot.net. And if you go to Learn Architecture Guides, Blazor for Web Form Developers, free book. So yeah, it was, in fact, a Web Form. Now, as far as Windows Classic, it depends. Uh, WinForms still works. WinForms is actively being developed and updated. It works on, w on 4K now. And if you have a WinForms application, you can update it to .NET Core 6. It'll be between 30 and 50% faster. And you can do a self-contained build, so you don't need to install .NET on the machine. You can just X copy. And you can do self-contained as a single executable. So you have like baby smash.exe with no other files. When you run it, it's actually a zipped up version of .NET that unfolds into memory. And then it runs in memory, and it sits in a single executable. So you could run it off of a USB stick. So great question. Awesome. Cool. Great question. So the question is, can you, does it prune the dependency tree? We do have a thing called tree trimming. Tree trimming, imagine you take the family tree of all of the functions that your .NET application references or use it. You flip it upside down, so the tree is upside down now, and you shake it. And you shake all the functions off that you're not actually using actively. Then you would ship system.xml. But I didn't use the XML reader or the XML right? I only used the DOM, or I didn't, I didn't use any of those functions. Then don't ship them. So you tree trim the whole thing. And then if you use reflection, which we would not be able to detect, you have to go and put those into a config file that says, don't pull off those leaves. I, could, I might use them later. But you can tree trim .NET to about 118 megs. Yeah, great question. So yes, tree trimming works too.
Isn't this fun? What a wonderful time to be a developer, my friends. All right, let's go uh, somewhere else. <laughs>